our Father in heaven, as we gather together this evening, we are aware of and deeply thankful for this great land of America in which we live, a land that affords to all the wonderful opportunities of learning and education. We are mindful of the sacrifices that have been made in our behalf, and we pray for the power and strength to continue in that great tradition. We are thankful for our minds and the abilities which we possess, as well as the freedom to choose what we will do with both. We are grateful for our families, for the strength and the support that they have rendered. As we stand tonight at a crossroads in our lives, we would ask thee for courage, courage to continue to stretch and grow, to realize that although this is the close of a chapter in our lives, a new page awaits to be written upon tomorrow. We ask for faith, faith that what we are doing will add to the betterment of our society, our nation, and our world. And finally, we ask thee for humility, humility to accept our successes with grace and our achievements with confidence. We ask for these things and do so in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's certainly my privilege and my pleasure to welcome you here this evening, you graduates of 1983 of, in this commencement for Utah Technical College at Salt Lake. And I certainly also want to welcome the friends, the family and the friends of all you graduates. At this time, I would like to introduce the platform guests for you. And I would ask as I introduce them if each guest would stand briefly when I call their name. And then if you will, please hold your applause until all of the platform guests have been introduced. Lyle Campbell, recipient of the Distinguished Service Award. James Snurl, Vice President for Business. Jack May, recipient of a Distinguished Service Award. Burton Talmage, Vice President for Development. John Class, Chairman of the Institutional Council. Dr. Stephen Covey, guest speaker. Max Lowe, Vice President for Instruction. Ginger Onsvik, student speaker. Jill Olson, program participant. Warren Newsmeyer, member of the Institutional Council. Jeanette Kendrick, member of the Institutional Council. Louise Henson, member of the Institutional Council. Jerry Condor, vice chairman of the Institutional Council. Dr. Michael Homer, dean of the School of Business. Jeff Brueger, Dean of the School of External Programs and Continuing Education. Ann Erickson, Dean of the School of Technology and General Education. Walt White, Dean of the School of Trades and Industry. Sally Williams, participating dean of the skill for the deals, representing the Dean of the Skill Center, excuse me. And Lou Ann Paulson, representing the Dean of the Skill Center. Dr. David Terry, representing the Regents staff. Mrs. Barbara Ann Smith, member of the State Board of Vocational Education. J. Lynn Dugan, member of the State Board of Regents. David Monson, member of the State Board of Regents. J. Nelson, President Emeritus. Elizabeth Gilbert, student announcer. Kenneth Remington, student announcer. Loretta Walker, program participant. And Judd Morgan, Dean of Students and Grand Marshal. I would like to briefly touch on some highlights of the college year. 
But before I do that, let me tell you a story that Gene Kilpatrick, the, the, our ambassador to the UN, recently told a graduating class in Oklahoma. She said she wanted to wish the students well, and she, gave, she mentioned three wishes that she had. And one of those was based on the story that I'd like to tell you. She said, commencement of life after graduation is kind of like starting out on a tour with the, on the love boat. She says, as you get settled in there, some of you will take your deck, sta deck, deck chairs up to the front of the, of the ship, point them forward, and look to the future. And some of you will take your deck chairs to the back, and point them backwards, and look back and commiserate with yourself over what you've had to go through. And she said her wish is that all of you at least get your deck chairs opened. <laughs> We're living in exciting times for us, for the college, for our community, for the state and the nation and the world. We've heard much this year about high technology and about our transition as a society from the industrial age to the communications age. This move is led by the computer's ability to collect, classify, and make accessible such enormous amounts of information and orient it to our individual needs. Robotics is a way of life, or fast becoming so, especially in industry, including a robot as commencement speaker at one university this year. Utah Technical College at Salt Lake is an integral part of these major changes and is at the forefront of most of them because of the importance of technical and vocational education. With our 8,000 students fall quarter and 1,200 of those in computer technology, with the computer invading practically every program on campus, and with the many other impacts of our high-tech society, we must race just to keep up. At the college, we're graduating our first students with an Associate of Science degree this year, in addition to the many applied science degrees as we have done in other years. Although we have had co-op education for some time, this has been the year of real growth because this is the year of cooperating with business and industry. And co-op education has become the largest instructional operation on campus as it provides co-op experiences for students in almost every program. But it will have stiff competition from external programs in growth. External programs is designed to meet very specific educational needs of business and industry and to take the program to the site if requested. It appears that the 2,500 students last year, the first year for external programs, will be increased by 50% this year and perhaps as much next year. Due to the lack of finances, the college has for the first time been forced to impose specific enrollment limitations this spring. These limitations may Im be imposed for several years as demand exceeds the state's ability to provide the additional financial support necessary for additional students. We are concerned about maintaining quality of education, but you students continue to excel. Feedback from employers of our students continues to be very positive, and our students continue to excel in skill and technical competition, such as that through student clubs, both at the state and the national level. For instance, students are very active in such competition as VICA, Vocational Industrial Clubs of America, DECA, Distributive Education Clubs of America, and Phi Beta Lambda, the Future Business Leaders Club, and others. Use of student services has doubled this year 
and library usage increased 75% for the third consecutive year of such growth. The new college senate was formally established, senators elected, and the senate is now functioning. The UTC Salt Lake Foundation was finally established with a 20-member board of prominent business and industrial leaders. The UTC Salt Lake Alumni Association was formally charted and the first council elected. Funding was approved for phase one of a new business education building with groundbreaking plan for this fall. And I have a list of many more new and significant happenings at the college that I won't take time to read. I do feel the necessity to mention one other item because it will, in my opinion, have the greatest, most far-reaching impact on the college. College faculty and staff will, see, will receive no salary increase for next year due to scarce finances. The volume of statistical data has been growing arithmetically for several years, showing a steady decline in salaries of college faculty in comparison with almost other, all other fields. That volume and the rate of change are now increasing geometrically. Teachers stay at the college because of loyalty and dedication, but financial obligations to their families are forcing an increasing number to choose other employment. The commitment that society, that the comment that society is in a race between education and chaos was never more true than today. And the present financial situation of college faculty increases the possibility that education is losing. Let me extend my congratulations to you students graduating today and wish you well as you commence your new experiences. Let me also express my appreciation to you faculty members who maintain the quality of education on our campus, who are truly a community of scholars, and to the staff that keeps the campus functioning so well. Thank you. Commencement will now proceed as indicated in your programs. Mr. May, to join me, please. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present this Distinguished Service Award to Mr. Jack F. May. Having devoted himself unselfishly to supporting Utah Technical College by serving as president of the Utah Technical College Foundation and having assisted the college by energetically stressing its importance to men and women of influence throughout the Wasatch Front and having prepared himself for a leadership role by gaining a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Woodbury College in Los Angeles, and through diligent military service and professional advancement, and having achieved the presidency of May Foundry and Machine Company in Salt Lake City, and having served also as president of the American Foundry Society, American Society for Metals, and the Utah Manufacturing Association and having developed himself as a well-rounded individual intensely concerned for his fellow beings. Now, therefore, this citation is awarded as an expression of the respect held by the administration, faculty, students, and staff of Utah Technical College to Jack F. May. Mr. May. Thank you very much. I appreciate being invited this evening and giving, given the recognition that I have received. I want to thank President Carnahan and those others who invited me to become a member of the board of the, Utah, of the 
College Foundation, and I am particularly grateful for being honored as having been named their president. The foundation has about 10 prime objectives at this time. Gaining statewide recognition of the college is the most important. It is called friend raising. Our efforts for <clears throat> past five months have focused on this and I am pleased with the results. In the coming months, the other objectives will be addressed and with such an outstanding board, I feel confident that all our objectives will be met. To all of you here tonight who are graduating, I wish you good luck, good health, and a good job of your choosing. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to uh, make the presentation of this Distinguished Service Award to Mr. Lyle K. Campbell. I would like to read the award. Having participated as friend and advocate of Utah Technical College for many years, and having served as a member and vice chairman of Utah Technical College Advisory Council, and as a member of the Presidential Search Committee, which resulted in the appointment of Dr. Orville D. Carnahan as president, and having prepared himself for a professional career by graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in business management from the University of Utah, and subsequently by attending management and supervisory classes at Utah Technical College, and having become executive vice president and co-owner of Wheeler Machinery Company, and having contributed of his time, effort, and means to a variety of civic, business, religious, and charitable organizations. Now, therefore, this citation is awarded as an expression of the respect held by the administration, faculty, students, staff of Utah Technical College to Lyle K. Campbell. Congratulations. My association with the Utah Technical College has created many good memories, especially those of accomplishment and progress as this school has become a vital and a respected force in our community. Each of you graduating here this evening should be very proud. I'm thankful for this honor which I have been given and I gratefully accept it. I have come to realize, however, that I am the one who has benefited from my involvement with the school. Personally, through courses that I have taken and through close friendships that have resulted, through my family who have attended classes and graduated from programs of this school, and through my business. Over 100 graduates from this institution have joined us in our company and are continuing to contribute greatly to our success. I have complete confidence in the leadership of the Utah Technical College at Salt Lake and in its future. And I pledge my continuing support and commend you, who are new graduates here tonight, to follow the same course. You who have participated in, who have contributed to, and who have received from this fine institution. May life's choice blessings be with you. Thank you. Good evening, President Carnahan, honored guests, parents, friends, and graduates. A few years ago, a young man stood behind a New England counter as a clerk, 
quiet, honest, and faithful, yet a failure in the eyes of his employer, who one day drew aside the father of the boy and advised that the son be taken back to the farm, for he would never become a merchant. Today, if you walk down State Street, Chicago, you will behold this young man's monument, a tribute to the failures, disappointments, and iron persistence of Marshall Field, who died the greatest merchant in the world. He had learned to walk past his failures. The success we have had comes from our ability to walk past our failures. It is this same ability that will continue to bring us success in all we do. The years we've spent in receiving an education have been filled with obstacles and disappointments. Sometimes these obstacles seemed insurmountable, but yet we were able to overcome them and continue on towards the goal we had set for ourselves, the goal of a good education. As we leave Utah Technical College, we take with us the confidence that we can achieve anything we set out to do. Some of us will continue our education and others will seek employment. No matter what decision we make, the formula for success is still the same. Learn to walk past your failures. I would like to share with you the story of a man with the ability to walk past his failures. In 1831, this man failed in business. A year later, he was defeated for a seat in the legislature. A year after that, he failed in business again. Finally, he was elected to the legislature, only to suffer a nervous breakdown two months later. He was defeated in elections for speaker, elector, land officer, and congressman. After he was finally elected to Congress, he was defeated for re-election. He twice failed to gain a seat in the Senate and in 1856 he was defeated for vice president. But still this man persisted and in 1860, almost 30 years after his first failure, Abraham Lincoln was elected President of the United States. Had Lincoln let any of his failures stop him, America would have lost one of the greatest presidents in its history. Lincoln learned to walk past his failures and the success he achieved is the marvel and inspiration of the ages. Success is not measured by tangible assets. Lincoln left le next to nothing in monetary terms, but still he was successful. Mrs. A.J. Stanley tells us that he who has lived well, laughed often, and loved much is a man who has achieved success. Success can only be determined by the feeling of accomplishment within ourselves. Don't let your failures discourage you. Success is not something you can achieve instantly. It consists of getting up just one more time than you fall. History is littered with many examples of men who failed many times but were persistent in their endeavors to achieve their goals. Men so persistent that they were often called fools by others. Fools like the Wright brothers who persisted in trying to fly even though history was full of names of men who had killed themselves by such foolishness. Fools like Westinghouse, who imagined that a train could be stopped by jamming air against its wheels. The failures these men faced were not small failures. Indeed, these men would have been justified had they decided to quit at any time. But they didn't quit. They persisted and reached their goals just as we must persist and walk past our failures if we are to reach our goals. Education has opened many doors for us. However, there are still innumerable doors shut tight, unopened yet. These are the doors of the future. We are the only ones that can decide if these doors will be opened or if they will remain shut. We must have the desire and the determination to achieve our goals. Success can only be ours if we learn to walk past our failures. Dr. Stephen R. Covey, Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior and Business Management, at Brigham Young University is one of the most sought after speakers in this state and throughout the nation. By businessmen, educational and professional associations, conventions, sales gatherings, church organizations, and many other groups. 
Dr. Covey is a native of Salt Lake City and has been associated with BYU since 1957. He has also served as visiting professor at Belfast Technical College, University of Utah in BYU, Hawaii. He is the recipient of the Carl G. Major and Adult Education Teaching Awards for Teaching Excellence and the 1982 Faculty Award for the National University Continuing Education Association. The author of several manuals and three books, Dr. Covey will soon publish a fourth book, Seven Basic Habits of Highly Effective People. While at BYU, Professor Covey has also served as administrative assistant to President Ernest L. Wilkinson and is director of university relations. He has been a regional representative for the LDS Church and president of the LDS Irish Mission. Many other accomplishments could be listed, but perhaps Dr. Covey's greatest accomplishments are reflected in the words of his secretary when she said, Dr. Covey is just a wonderful man. He really lives what he teaches. Dr. Covey. First, I would like to add my congratulations to all of the graduates on this tremendous achievement. I'm sure it is very satisfying to you and to all of your loved ones. T.S. Eliot, a great philosopher, put into words the essence of my message tonight. We shall never cease from striving, and the end of all of our striving will be to end up where we began and to know the place for the first time. There are certain fundamental principles, priorities, realities, values, which never change. And any true and permanent success reflects them, builds upon them, utilizes them. I recently made a study of the success literature in this country over a period of 200 years. Success literature, it was the popular success literature. Like the books you see in bookstores. And it was a most interesting study. For the first 150 years of this country's history, the focus, almost the entire focus of that success literature was on character. You could call it the character ethic. In other words, industry, integrity, honesty, fidelity, thriftiness, self-discipline, and so forth. For the last 50 years, the focus has shifted away from the character ethic to what might be called the personality ethic, which tended to take two basic approaches. One, the PMA, or the positive mental attitude approach, and two, human relations techniques, the human technologies on how to lubricate the processes of life. You can test it for yourself by walking through any bookstore, a large, popular bookstore. Just go into the areas where it talks about success psychology, self-image psychology, self-improvement, and look at the titles. Open some of the books, purview their contents, and you can begin to get a sense 
of what a fundamental shift has taken place. Most of them give some lip service to the character ethic, but not too much. The focus is more on self and what a person can do themselves, what people can do themselves to further their own situations, their own careers, to strengthen their own personalities. I would like to suggest to you graduates four fundamental character principles, four basic priorities which are sequentially arranged. In other words, they build upon each other. We can't do calculus if we don't understand algebra or algebra before we understand basic math. Similarly, I suggest these four basic principles or priorities are arranged in such a way that you cannot do the latter ones until you have some degree of mastery of the former ones. I'll show you what I mean. The first one, take responsibility, meaning focus on things you can do something about rather than blaming or copying out. Second, lead a disciplined life. Third, focus on contribution out there, contribution making a difference in your family, in the various institutions you belong to, in your work, in the world at large. These two special degrees tonight are illustrative of individuals who have made significant contributions, these special awards. Focus on contribution. And fourth, work well in the one-on-one -on -one situation. Most of the significant work in this world takes place person to person, one-on-one. -on -one. Now to show how these are sequentially arranged, a person who takes responsibility for themselves can lead a disciplined life. But if a person had an attitude of blaming the environment or other people or situations or their parents or their background or their genes for their situation. They would be essentially absolved of lead, leading a disciplined life. And only people who lead disciplined lives can contribute. Otherwise, they're constantly struggling to achieve a mastery of themselves. The highest of all masteries is mastery over self. Then, once you master yourself, you can give of yourself. But people who attempt to give of themselves to contribute without achieving an internal mastery will find themselves under the first stress situation, caving in. Let's explore each one of these for a moment. Determinism means we are a product of what has happened to us. There are three fundamental, well-accepted philosophies of determinism today. One is we're a product of our genes. Another, we're a product of our childhood. And another, we're a product of the present environment. And therefore, fundamentally, we have little, if any, freedom to make our own way, to make contributions, because we are so conditioned by all of these forces. Part of the data, the facts that people have examined to come up with those theories, comes from the study of animals or of sick people, neurotics and psychotics, not of healthy people contributing creative productive people. The database is completely inadequate. 
If you want to study what you are truly like, potentially like, what you can become like, study the best people the world has ever produced. And most of them, like the illustration given by the earlier speaker regarding President Lincoln, came out of impoverished circumstances. They subordinated feelings, moods to values. They rose above environment. There is no destiny that is determined outside ourselves. We alone are in control of that. And it's so vitally important that we believe in ourselves and take responsibility. The tendency to blame, to blame the government, to blame the culture, the society, the adult world, is a negative energy tendency. There may be a lot of validity in the problems out there, but the key is to focus upon things over which we have control. Imagine two circles, the inner circle of influence and the outer circle of concern. Highly effective and successful people focus on the inner circle. Daniel and Joseph of the Old Testament were both unjustly imprisoned. Within a short period of time, they were running the prisons. People who give their energies to things over which they have control, including the ability to control their own attitude toward things over which they have no control, such people gradually enlarge that circle of influence. And little by little, it begins to encompass almost all of their concerns. Their energy is essentially positive. People who focus on the outside, the weakness of another, the spouse, the boss, policies, programs, teachers, leaders, will find themselves engulfed by a spirit of negative energy and cynicism that will feed upon itself until the circle of influence increasingly is weakened, lessens, becomes smaller, it shrinks. Test it for yourself in any environment. Try it for a month. Be a light, not a judge, and watch what begins to happen around you. If you're ever discouraged or feel self-pitying because of circumstances, read the little autobiographical account by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning, which recounts his experiences in the death camps of Nazi Germany as a captured political prisoner, a Jew. He experienced torture and indignities beyond description. One day they put him under white light, stripped him naked, and began to perform these ignoble sterilization experiments upon his body. And he discovered what he called the last ultimate freedom. I have the power to choose my response to any given set of circumstances. And through a series of disciplines, internal disciplines, mental, emotional, moral, he exercises this small embryonic freedom until he developed more than his Nazi captors. They had more liberty, if you can see how I'm using this term. Liberty is a condition of the environment. Freedom is a condition of the person. They had more liberty than he, but he had more freedom than they. So in any circumstance, deeply dig inside. Realize you are not like animals. You are aware of the conditioning experiences and you can choose your own response to those. You can truly subordinate feelings to values, conditions to decisions, and take charge, take responsibility. The key to this, I suggest, is to cultivate basic disciplines. Consider the following. Three dimensions of our own personality. Four dimensions. The physical, the mental, the spiritual, and the emotional. To lead a disciplined life means that we are in control of those dimensions and that we direct them. The body is a bad master, a good servant. So to cultivate the habits of basic health, exercise, good nutrition, rest, relaxation, 
to keep our own physical environment, our homes, our cars, clean and organized. The whole way that we handle the physical environment and properties bespeaks a discipline. Though it may seem small, it has great implications. Take the world of the mind. You've been working and studying hard. We must continue. Absolutely we must continue. Because the world is changing so deeply, so rapidly. There is really no economic security in any job. The only true economic security lies in the power to produce, to contribute, to find and solve problems, to learn, to continue to learn, to communicate. And little by little in a changing environment, people who don't continually discipline their minds will find themselves obsolete. And then they'll become defensive and inwardly angry, and then they tend to find fault out there. Avoid that trap. Make your mind up as you leave the school to continue your education, continuously read, study deeply, challenge yourself. Take the spiritual disciplines, the classical disciplines of every religious system are these four. Meditation, study, fasting, and prayer. Take the moral discipline of living a life of integrity. A great man once said, everyone worries about being cheated. The true test of a person comes when they worry about cheating somebody else. To be a person who can be trusted, relied upon, the greatest ability is dependability. A person whose word is their bond is an absolutely vital aspect of this kind of moral and spiritual discipline. Shakespeare wrote, to thine own self be true, and then it follows, as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. The emotional discipline of learning to love, to listen, to respond to the needs of other people. All of these disciplines together, if people would exercise them regularly, it'll constantly keep them tuned and sharpened. I call them sharpening the saw regularly. Never get too busy sawing, you don't take time to sharpen the saw. At least an hour a day, and hopefully more, but a minimum for the rest of our lives. Third, focus on contribution. You will find in the long run that health, wealth, and happiness are byproducts. You go after any one of them as an end in themselves, and they will become elusive. You will lose them. Listen to Hans Selye, the international expert from Montreal on stress. He shows that as soon as people in their life begin to lose a sense of contribution, a sense of meaningful projects, a sense of paying their rent on earth through service, a sense of having a project out there that pulls them on, that drives them on, it will begin to break down the immune system of the body and accelerate the degenerative forces within the body. And the people will simply become sicker and they'll die earlier. If you're interested in the data on that, read his book called Stress Without Distress. He calls the positive kind of stress eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -E -E -S, and that it literally renews the body and the mind. So never think of a life of leisure and retirement. Think of a life of contribution, of blessing other people's lives continuously. Focus on contribution. Regarding wealth. Recent studies that I have reviewed have indicated that people who acquire and keep wealth are those who have done it through their own productive effort, their own expertise, their own interests. There are many people who make a lot of money through speculation or through windfall gains, but the evidence shows Few of them keep it. Few of them become permanently wealthy. 
most interesting study. And I think all of us, without belaboring the point, know that true happiness, true joy, is a product of selfless service. It may not always be pleasurable, but the deepest inner satisfactions come when we contribute, when we attempt to influence for good other people. Fourth, and finally, work one-on-one. -on -one. I think you will find generally that if you can work well with one other person, particularly people who may not be that lovable, that easy to work with, you can pretty well do everything else very well. Dag Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General of the United Nations that was killed in that plane crash over Africa several years ago, in his little book, Markings, made this very profound, inspiring, instructive statement. It is more noble to give yourself completely to one individual than to labor diligently for the salvation of the masses. Again, it is more noble to give yourself completely to one individual than to labor diligently for the masses. In other words, you could be very dedicated at your jobs and have many important projects out there and many people or needs you're serving out there and may not even have a good relationship with your own spouse, your husband or your wife or a son or daughter or one key working associate. And you will find that it will take more nobility of character in the form of courage and humility and love to do whatever is necessary to rebuild that one relationship. And the problem with the one is like a cancer. It spreads and it begins to undermine and infect the other tissues of our life, the other dimensions of our life. I think it is a true principle. The key to the 99 is the one. Because in a very real sense, everybody is a one. Even as I speak now, I like to look at you individually in the eye as if I'm speaking to the one. I find there's a whole different emotional, mental attitude when I just speak to a group of people I cannot see and don't individually recognize that they are individuals. When I give my grades, it is a very difficult time because I know the significance of those grades. And even though someone may look at the grade sheet after I finish and say, well, you gave them so many A's, B's, and C's, and so forth, I know that every one of them had to be individually concerned with, focused upon. With my children, I find the key is one on one. As soon as there is one other person, it changes the whole dynamic. In work, in the outside world, I find it's the relationship with the one where you can show individual appreciation to the one, not generalized appreciation. There seems to be tremendous power in the ability to work one on one. I think it's the key to effectiveness. Well, these are the four points. If you can try to remember them, take responsibility Get out of the blaming, if things go wrong, get out of the labeling mode toward people, even toward yourself. Don't ever limit yourself with a label by saying, this is what I'm like, I'm a night person, I'm not pleasant in the morning, I'm Mr. Impatient, I've got a short fuse, I've never been able to do that. Never say no to your potential. None of us have barely scratched the potential that is deeply within us and over a period of time will become increasingly enlarged and released. Second, lead a disciplined life. Consider the four dimensions, the physical, the mental, the spiritual, the emotional. Third, focus on contribution, not on self, not on pleasure, on contribution. The other good things of life will follow. And fourth, work one-on-one. -on -one. The highest of all relationships is a one-on-one. -on -one. It comes through prayer. And the more that people can 
put the Lord at the center of their life, they will find the greatest organizing principle in putting everything else into its proper place. My conviction really is this, that when we put him first, he will tell us what comes second, and everything else will work together for our good. Well, I congratulate everybody here, and I appreciate your contributions and your tremendous potential, and all of these faculty people and the staff and all of the parents who have given you such great support. In the words of Han Solo, may the force be with you. Thank you.
Each year when I have this opportunity, I am convinced it's the most pleasant part of the program because I get to present the graduates to receive their awards. But before that, I do that, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the faculty and staff here at Utah Technical College to congratulate you students and to indicate to the parents and friends and relatives that are here today that these students have achieved this year and have gone through some very rigorous programs as I'm sure many of you can attest because I'm sure many of you have, especially the wives, have sat home and husbands, perhaps tended kids while many of these students have been studying and taking classes. But they have achieved. Uh, the President alluded to the fact that many of our students have gone into national competition you know, through, for, with students from all over the United States in many of these fields and consistently bring back gold medals, silver medals and bronze medals far in excess to the numbers that we're able to send. And at every conference I get a chance to go to where I meet other uh, administrators from other colleges. All I have to do is say I'm from Utah Technical College and they know me because they know the students and the quality of the students that come through the programs. In addition, we've been receiving feedback from employers of your predecessors, your last graduating class, who not only attest to the quality of the knowledge that the students come out with, but to the work ethic, the quality of work that the students produce. And this class is no exception. In fact, we have many, many achievers, as you will note, that go through and receive their diplomas. You'll notice the little uh, gold and silver cords that many will be wearing. The silver cords represent those students who have achieved a 3.5 up to a 3.8 grade point average during their program here at the college. And that is a tremendous achievement. They are on the dean's list. The gold cords represent those students who have between a 3.8 and a 4 point grade point average, which is as good as they can get. And we're tremendously proud of those students. However, lest, uh, lest I leave it at that just for those uh, high grade achievers, I might remind them of the story that was told me very recently that out in the business world there are many A students who work for companies that are managed by B students and owned by C students. <laughs> that is not to take away from the achievement that they have and I certainly didn't mean it that way because the courses are rigorous and they have achieved. I think the students would also want me at this point to thank their parents, their wives, their husbands, their sweethearts for the support that they've given, that you've given them in this undertaking, in this achievement. I think uh, they would all be willing to admit you can't do it totally alone. And so I'd like to thank you. Now, on behalf of the faculty and staff, I would like to ask a special favor of you because our success is not seeing you graduate necessarily. It helps. But the real success is the jobs you will obtain. So we want you to keep in touch as you obtain those jobs and, and let us know your successes. Because in reality, Utah Technical College at Salt Lake's reputation rides on you and the jobs you do and the reputations you establish in the world of work. Would the graduates please arise? President, on behalf of the faculty and staff, I would like to recommend these students to you that they may receive their de uh, degrees, diplomas, and certificates and indicate to you that they have met all of the requirements for those awards. As president of Utah Technical College at Salt Lake, and in behalf of the State Board of Regents and the Institutional Council, 
I accept you as graduates of the college. Now, will you please be seated until you all are called forward to receive your diplomas and certificates. These are the graduates of the School of Accounting. Joy Luella Adams. Eileen P. Manis. Nancy Jean Kugel. Josephine Grill. Susan I. Montoya. Daniel Victor Saldivar. Betty R. Williams. Dennis Leo Player. Paul Harold Bagley. Dolan Russell Robs. Jean B. Robertson. Trudy S. Perkins. Stana L. Johansson. Richard D. Loftus. Monica Lisbeth Colby. Sherry Clark. Marsha Louise Loudenbeck. Fred William Rose. Lauren H. Bishop. T. Richard Jin. These are the students graduating from the School of Apprenticeship. George Ernest Roche. Blaine C. Beck. These are the students graduating from the School of Architectural Technology. Dartnell. Nancy Lucia. Cherry Johnson. Jerry Ann Pitts. Julie Costanza. Sherry Gladys Alcorn.
Jill E. Olson, Practical Nursing. Ginger R. Hansvik, Data Processing. Elizabeth L. Gilbert, Executive Secretary. Kenneth G. Remington, Electronic Technology. We sincerely mean it. Now, will the graduates please arise for the last official ceremonial item. And my staff has briefed me on this many times to help me so I don't forget how to do it. Graduates, now that you've received your diplomas and certificates, you may now move the tassel from the one side to the other. <laughs> Please take your seats. I have two other announcements I would like to make. One, for those with, of us with heart conditions and can't make it all the way up those flight of stairs, I am to announce there will be no formal recessional march afterwards, after the benediction. And the second item is that we'll ask our Dean of Students, uh, Mr. Judd Morgan, to give us the benediction. Our Father, we bow and offer our benediction on these graduation ceremonies. Father, we're grateful for all that has brought us to this point in our lives. For our parents, our loved ones, and those who have instructed us. For those we love and those who have given us love, Father. For all of those who have sacrificed for us. Now, Father, knowing that this point is only a beginning, we ask for thy inspiration to contribute unselfishly those skills which we now possess, that those who follow might enjoy the freedoms which are now ours. Father, we're grateful for expression. We're grateful for this place in which we live and for the opportunities we're afforded. Bless us that we might always recognize and appreciate these blessings. Now, Father, we close and pray for thy blessings in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.